was like my first goal. And you need something like that to kind of figure out what quantity you want to be selling, what is realistic, how many loaves of bread are you going to have to sell to make that amount of money? Can I make that many loaves of bread in my home? I remember we wrote out everything we yeah. wanted to have that weekend just to see, is this actually going to make us yes. what in our heads we think we can make? We definitely needed that to figure out, is this worth it? Because our time is really precious right now. And then when you reach those goals, it's so exciting and encouraging. It makes you feel like you're doing the right thing. My name is Lisa, mother of eight and creator of the blog and YouTube channel Farmhouse on Boone. Join me as I share with you my love for creating a handmade home from scratch cooking and a little mom and entrepreneur life along the way. Welcome back to the Simple Farmhouse Life podcast. Today's topic is so interesting, so intriguing to me. We're going to talk to two ladies from the Flower Barn Bakery who were able to take their micro bakery business and turn it into a successful business to meet their family's goals. This is a topic that you might not even have known that you were interested in or needed, but I think that there needs to be a movement across the country of these micro bakeries, not only are they helpful for the family's finances when they're starting them, but also they are just so cute. I want to go to one. I want to go to one in my own town. I might have to actually travel up to Ohio to go to this one. Anyways, without further ado, we're going to talk about the financial side of starting a micro bakery, how to get it done with kids around as a stay-at-home mom, and everything that these two ladies who are very successful with this, who have done it in a very smart way, have already experienced and can share it with you. Well, Lily and Ellen, I'm so glad to have you on. You are the co-founders, I'm going to assume, of the Flower Barn Bakery, a micro bakery that you run out of your homes, I'm assuming. So we're going to chat about that. This is a topic I've been wanting to talk about because it's come up a lot. I think it's becoming really popular. There's several ladies in my area that do it as well. So yeah, introduce you and tell us a little bit about your bakery. Okay, so I'm Ellen. And I'm Lily. And we do, we run a micro bakery, but we actually do have a storefront. So it's a barn located on our family farm. Yeah. No, oh, okay. Okay, sorry. It's, we used to do it out of our home, but now it's gotcha. um, a okay. barn that's on our family farm property. Yeah. yeah. So we're open one day a week. Oh, cool. We're open on Saturdays okay. from 8 to 11. And we sell sourdough bread. We sell different pastries like croissants, Danish, scones, muffins, all the typical stuff. And then we also offer a weekly class on mm -hmm. baking, um, homesteading, farming, gardening, those sort of things. And we also recently started doing blogging kind of to supplement our class yeah. classes, you know, like all our class outlines you can find on the blog, all of those recipes and everything. So yeah, that's kind of what we're up to. And then we're both moms. Um, Ellen has four kids and mm -hmm. I have two. Yeah. So yeah, she's very busy. So there's a lot of balancing <laughs> going on. Yes. Yes. yes, I understand. Yes. Yeah. So I'm curious about like, I don't even know where to start because there's so many questions I have, like the finances of it and then how you bake. Like if you're selling on Saturdays, does that mean that you are preparing doughs starting Tuesday, Wednesday? I'm sure you have a schedule with exactly. certain doughs you probably start earlier in the week, certain doughs maybe you start the day before. How logistically are you doing this? Well, I think that's been the biggest thing we've learned throughout this is like what you can do to prep ahead so that um, we really do all of our baking on Saturday morning. So throughout the entire week, we are doing our dough preparation. We're making sauces. And rolling cinnamon rolls. So we utilize a refrigerator and do slow fermentation for everything. So I think that's been the biggest thing that we've had to learn as we grow is how to do all the prep work and get everything done so that you can fit things into a schedule, know exactly what mm -hmm. you're doing every day and be able to organize around your schedule and around your family. Yeah. Yeah. And we've just had to learn like what really can yeah. be prepped ahead, you know, like stuff you wouldn't expect mm -hmm. that you can freeze and, okay. and yeah. bake that morning. Yeah. I'm curious about all the details because I, when I, my second daughter was a baby. So it was probably the summer after she was born. She was probably like six to, you know, nine months that summer. I started selling bread at the farmer's market, but it was yeah. before I was really comfortable with doing sourdough. Yeah. And so I was just doing yeast breads and I spent that day like 
uh, crazy in the kitchen all day long. Mm -hmm. I hadn't figured out the schedule and how to fit little by little. And so of course it was stressful. It was hot. Yes. We didn't run air conditioning in our house at that time. Yikes. It was August. <laughs> um, so I just remember it being like, Ugh. so let's hear the details. Like what are some things that you freeze that you maybe do you start them Monday or do you even start them? How does the weekly flow look with what you're baking on Saturday? Okay. Well, I think a really good example is cookie dough because it's kind of basic and mm -hmm. everybody can do cookie dough. So we make our cookie dough as early as Monday, the week of, and then we, so we make a big batch of cookie dough and then we scoop it out onto trays and we freeze all of those cookie dough, cookie dough balls. Yeah. So like that in way, the scoop, like they're already a, scooped out. Yeah. So that way you can have like a big bucket of this cookie dough ready to go. Okay. And then you are placing it onto trays right before you bake right. it. So Saturday morning, all we have to do is get the cookie dough out, put it on cookie trays, bake it, and that's done. Yeah, like probably... For cinnamon rolls. Yeah. Cinnamon rolls is kind of the backbone of our business, I would okay. say. Okay. Those are the yeah. most popular. You probably made brioche maybe when you were doing yeasted breads. Did you ever make brioche when you sold at the farmer's market? No, all I did at that time was, I do brioche now with sourdough yeah. a lot, but at that time, all I did was a cinnamon raisin yeast bread. That was yeah. it. That was all I did, but I couldn't, I hadn't figured out the whole timing thing. Yeah. Well, that's kind of like how we base it is we only do one type of, we basically mostly do one type of bread. Brioche dough is like the base of our cinnamon rolls, our danishes, Oh, and okay. what else do we use brioche? Crust our pastries. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so on Wednesday, we make all of our brioche dough and we mix it all and it goes in the refrigerator. So it is just sitting there ready to become whatever it's going to become. Um, and then we had to kind of play with the yeast amount. So that is a yeast of dough. We play played around with that to make sure that it's not over in the refrigerator. Um, so that we had to decrease the yeast a lot. From like your traditional brioche recipe. And then on Friday, we pull that dough out of the refrigerator and we roll cinnamon rolls and laminate it for our danishes. And then it goes back in the refrigerator. And on Saturday morning, we just pull it out, let it rise and bake it. So part of the reason we do it ahead is for that fermentation, for flavor and stuff. And then the other part is to help us to be able to handle it all and then bake it fresh on Saturday. Mm -hmm. So on Wednesday, we mix it all up and then it goes right into the fridge before it starts to rise. So it doesn't over proof, you know? Right. So yeah. 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 So we decrease the yeast. So it's, it does a longer proof and then we put it into the fridge. Okay. And then we get it out to do the shaping. So whether that's you're shaping loaves or you're shaping your cinnamon rolls or you're laminating it like a croissant is laminated with butter, all of that happens uh -huh, yeah. um, after the first bulk rise that's in the fridge. Mm -hmm. And then you put it back in the fridge as soon as it's shaped and then you let it do its final proof on Saturday morning. So I think people can relate the to fridge. those, you know, first rise, second rise. Yeah. In the fridge. Yeah. Okay, so it probably took you some time to figure out how long each recipe was okay cuz you know you have your out of the fridge rise that that can be 1 or 2 hours if it's really warm, mm -hmm. you know it could be a little faster, but then in fridge it probably took you a little bit to figure this whole logistics thing out, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. And I think like most people who are doing micro bakeries, if you're just doing it in your home, and you're not doing too much, it's hard to sacrifice um, your product for experimentation's yeah. sake. You know, you're a little bit yes. afraid to just try things out. Yeah. But because we're making so much, we're able to kind of just, you know, try one thing one week, try another thing the next week, and eventually you figure it out. And I will say, yes. I think our customers have been so gracious. <laughs> They've really persevered through all of our experimentation, <laughs> yeah. which has been yeah. really wonderful. <laughs> there were definitely some very artists. Do you do any custom orders or is it, do you stick to what your menu says and then you just go down the line? I'm sure you have people reaching out saying, mm -hmm. Hey, will you make me a rosemary garlic this or a blueberry, right? Do you have a lot of that special request? So yes. And we, we started out doing custom orders a little bit more and we just found that it did not work well for us. It was very difficult to make mm -hmm. really small batches yeah. of things. And 
it just didn't work with our business plan. So we've basically kind of gotten to where we uh-huh. don't offer that anymore. Um, yeah. I think it's something that helps you grow taking custom orders, but then when you get to the point where you can just be like, this is what I'm able to make. This is what I'm offering. Um, usually people are really receptive to that. Yeah. 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 What are some of your top tips for making it profitable and fitting into your schedule? You already mentioned that you use one dough to make multiple things, which doing a high, like large batch of something seems really smart because you can take that and turn it into a lot of things. Not taking custom orders is probably another thing you learned where it wasn't really worth the time invested away from your family. It, it works better on a larger scale. Do you have any other tips that you've figured out? Okay, don't do that. This is a common mistake maybe people make. Well, I think kind of figuring out what gives you the biggest bang for your buck. Like I know there was a time we were making like mini hand pies and we yeah. were like hand rolling each pie crust, and, you know, right. <laughs> and that was fun and it's really pretty yes, and it's people fun. really like it. But <laughs> I mean, there's only so much you can charge for this tiny little pie right. and it is a huge <laughs> amount of labor. Yeah. So, I mean, things like that, we've definitely learned what works best in our space and what works best with our yeah. schedule. Um, and that's just kind of everybody experimenting and figuring that out. Do you have anything else? I think we often talk about, and I think you talk about this a lot too, is setting a goal for yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Especially a financial goal, because even if you love baking, it has to eventually be worth the sacrifice. Yes, absolutely. Because it, there's no way yeah, to avoid it being, you have to sacrifice something, Yes, you know, whether that's time or energy Clean kitchen energy mind power <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah my children have learned like there's there's some strategy to it because we have these homeschool maker markets and my daughter always wants to do like a little micro bakery just for the day if you will like she always wants to make something sourdough and we've we did the last one we did which was the pr- previous to the one we just did but the like second to last one we did hand pies like you said And Mm -hmm. at the end of the day, it was like you and my niece together made hundred dollars and we spent the entire day. And so you do have to learn that lesson. Not everything, you know, not the same amount of time will yield the same amount of results. There's Mm -hmm. definitely a a way to work smarter on it and not harder necessarily. Yeah. Yeah. And that's just something you have to kind of learn for yourself, I think, Um, and figure out what your customers are interested. That's definitely a big part of it. Because there's been so many things we thought were going to yeah. go over really well and be exciting, and no one was interested at all. Um, yeah. yeah. Really? What are <laughs> yeah. some examples of that? What's a good example? I think a good example would be our sourdough subscription. Yes. that. that was- yeah. So we did first, we thought okay. nobody's going to come out to get sourdough every week. We're not going to be able to guess how much we're going to yeah. sell in a week. Let's just have people sign up and then they can come uh, monthly or I think it was biweekly yeah. and they get a sourdough loaf, a whole wheat loaf and a couple other sweets like scones or something. Yeah. Gonna throw in there. That did not okay. go at all. Yeah. And yeah. probably there are some huh. areas where that would be very popular. Yeah. I, it's just kind of hit or miss sometimes. But then we just decided let's go for this sourdough every single week and people just coming and picking it up. And that ended up going really well. Yeah. And now we sell quite a few loaves every single week and we sell out almost every single week. So it, it's just not what we would have predicted, but you have to try that kind of thing yeah. and you have to be willing to let go yeah. too, yeah. instead of just keep beating a dead horse. You know? yeah. An idea that you thought was yeah. going to be mm-hmm. so yeah. good. Yes. I, my sister sells meat at a farmer's market and she thinks it's interesting how if you tell the people what you'll use it for, like if you say this is fajita meat, not strip steak or whatever yeah. it is, yeah. she'll have to relabel it to suggest what they're going to use it for and then they buy it. But if if it's just like they're confused. So have you noticed any little tweaks like that that make people more interested yes. in buying it? So we have sold brownies for a long time. (laughs) This is fine. We've sold brownies forever and we always sold them with chocolate buttercream on them. And we were getting to the point where we were going to have to decrease the amount we made every week. Well, then it was the eclipse and we decided to sell cosmic brownies. We really did not. And we changed the icing on them. them (laughs) Cosmic brownies. And we have had to double what we are making for our brownies. So there is definitely presentation and framing things. 
can change. Yes. Things sell marketing. 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 It's so <laughs> important. People live on money though. Cosmic brownies. That's what yes. They're like, did you sell these? Yeah, cosmic brownies. Like, did you always sell brownies? I'm like, literally from the first day we opened, we've <laughs> sold these brownies. brownies. Yes. <laughs> no one cared. <laughs> Yeah. It's so funny because you just don't really think marketing is that important. Yeah. I mean, we know it is because we see commercials from big companies, but even on a small scale, just how you present something, whether that's a blog post, a YouTube video, a baked item, yeah. meat, it just changes people's perception and whether or not they think they want it. So even on a small scale, it pays to pay attention to that marketing yeah. stuff. We're all, you know, marketers mm -hmm. from the micro home bakery or yeah location, whatever. We're all in a sense, like there's some marketing to be done. So that is really interesting. Yeah. Now you talked about people not having to make an order. So you don't have anybody, you don't know who's going to show up. Have you ever ended up with too much well, or you probably have it dialed in at this we point? We actually have some, a way we started our mm -hmm. business was actually with pre-order, yes. but it's weekly pre-order. So mm -hmm. at the beginning okay. of the week, our site opens up and we have a pre-order menu and you can choose like six cinnamon rolls or okay. a cream croissant. And that's how we got started Yeah, was um, just pre-order. And we actually did delivery too. We allowed to go into delivery, but then we found people actually wanted to come out to the farm and they wanted yeah. that experience of coming to pick up their weekly loaf of bread. So that's when we kind of decided we could handle doing this micro bakery mm -hmm. where we didn't just sell pre-order, but we had things for people to pick from while they were there. Yeah. You okay. Know, we had yeah. these people who were kind of forced to come to pick up. So we thought, well, why don't we offer a couple things for them to um, add Look to their order it. while they're here? Yeah. I remember the first week we did it, we had 11 pre-orders and we were like 11 people are coming <laughs> And we could sell other things to 11 people. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and it seemed yeah. very exciting. It's a huge thing. And um, so that was our first, we called it the pop-up on the port. And that was the first time we sold additional items like our um, pastries. And we had these little cakes. Talk about things that are too much time and not worth all the labor. We were making these like two-inch cakes. <laughs> the effort, yeah. <laughs> and hand decorating these tiny little cakes. Ooh, yeah. They were uh, crazy. <laughs> but yeah, so now our they business... They were good, but they crazy. Good. Yeah. Oh, I'm sure. <laughs> now our business, we do have we do have the pre-order every week. And that does give us a really good idea of how much to make. And then we also have our case. Okay. So it's a combination. Okay. Yeah. And that gives you an idea of how many people are going to show up. So if they show up and buy something else, yeah, you probably have exactly. a good idea of like, if we have... 25 people coming, then most likely we're going to sell, you know, 25 cosmic brownies or whatever. I'm sure you've exactly. figured that out. So has there been any time throughout this process where you did take on some financial risk or what is your tips for growing this without having to sacrifice, like without wasting basically? Yeah. Well, I think equipment is definitely the biggest um, financial burden for a micro bakery. And a lot of times you are trying to build your business and get by with what you have until you can afford um, that next step up. But definitely, I think refrigerators, the first time we realized that we could not get by without a commercial refrigerator, that was probably our biggest. Okay. Expense. And I think my biggest tip for that is, first of all, make sure that it fits in with your goal. Like I would say, if you're saying in order to reach your financial goal, you need to sell 60 loaves of bread a week, make sure that your equipment matches that goal. Like I need mm -hmm. this refrigerator in order to make 60 loaves of bread. I need a mixer in order to make the 60 loaves of bread. Um, but then also we have gotten all of our equipment off Facebook marketplace Okay. or Craigslist. Yeah. Um, and that has helped us immensely. I mean, you can really find a lot of good commercial equipment, dirty commercial. Yes. Equipment. You have to clean dirty, it up. Dirty. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. You're going to have to clean up, but I mean, that's really helped us a lot. Yeah. Okay. So I am curious, what do you have? What are all like, what's the necessary equipment? And then also, were you able to buy that equipment with the money that you were making and reinvest? Or did you have to save up money, buy the equipment and then start the bakery? How did that work? So we have actually never been in debt. So we've never taken on mm -hmm. any debt. In the beginning, we started with very little in our kitchen. And every time we made money, we put it right back into the business. Yeah. So 
currently some things that we have Mm -hmm. are we have a commercial sheeter which um is the most amazing thing ever is that for your cookies then (laughs) especially if you do cinnamon rolls oh okay okay um cookies cinnamon rolls and laminate so oh yeah but cookies is something something i want that (laughs) so bad (laughs) yeah you You need it it. you need it really i do everyone needs a laminate you said you made croissants one or a couple episodes. I don't know when you said it, but you said you made croissants. And I yeah, was like, I love- how, how did you do that without a sheeter? Because doing impressive. them by hand is a pain. <laughs> it is a pain, but I just love having pastry dough. It's so yeah. nice to have to put on like pot pies and then also to make little danishes. But I could be sold. You could... You you can sell me. Do you have an affiliate link on a sheeter? <laughs> Sorry, on go ahead. Sheeter. You can tell me that the rest of the stuff you, you guys make, have. Like a countertop version. Do they? Oh, that would be I, quite a. Comp- did not know <laughs> yeah, this. Yeah, yeah. Okay, all right. Yeah. Sorry, I got I got us a bit derailed with the sheeter thing. No. So, what else do you have? <laughs> no, it truly is like the most amazing. They changed our business. Yeah. I think that's the important thing with equipment is it really should. I mean, not only is it helping you to do what you're already doing more efficiently, but it really always opens a door for us to yeah. like, being able to sell a new product. Yeah. Being able to make a higher quantity, that sort of thing. Yeah. I think a, a good piece of advice is if you are feeling burnt out or overwhelmed yeah. by your baking business, reanalyze like what you're missing because it could be as simple as if I got just a little more freezer space in my garage, mm-hmm. if I got yeah. an extra freezer or a freezer in my basement, I could do this much more prep and my Saturdays would be so much easier. Yeah. You know, so just yeah. be willing to reevaluate and and it could just be a little bit more of an investment that saves you that stress and that burnout. Cause I saw a lot of people were asking about um how to Kids avoid burnout and baking with and yeah, yeah. baking from home and I think that helps. Think right yeah, yeah. yeah. I completely agree. So you have an extra freezer, extra fridge, you have the sheeter. What about the mixer? Did you get some kind of commercial mixer? And what about an oven as well? Yeah. So we have two commercial mixers. The first one I actually got when I was in high school, my ag teacher had it sitting in the shop. (laughs) This is not really a relevant (laughs) story, but like I got this mixer. He knew I baked and he was like, oh, you can have it. It'd come out of an old school or something. So, I mean, you do, you can pick things up pretty cheap if you look in the right places yeah but that was kind of like this, <laughs> the starting point of our baking journey and then we eventually got yeah. a much larger version of a commercial mixer um it's a i think it's a 60 quart mixer 60 so quart. check out like um pizza shops and Pe- yeah okay. we got that out of an old pizza shop um and we had to drive i think two hours to get it but it's definitely worth the drive it's very difficult to get inside so where do you um, keep that like where is that kept at the barn? Do you, or no, cause you're prepping in your own home. So or maybe you're not, sorry. <laughs> okay. Let's, I think we should maybe kind of paint a picture yes, of yeah, what that's a good idea. our, yes, I would love that. <laughs> bakery looks like. So yes, right now <laughs> we have this little barn on our property and inside of it, it started as kind of a summer kitchen but when we wanted to start selling baked goods, we got licensed as a commercial kitchen. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So okay. out in that barn is our little kitchen. And so we prep throughout the week in that kitchen mm-hmm. in the barn. And then on Saturdays, we reconfigure um, the way it looks into a very bakery style look. Mm-hmm. So we have a full glass case and we have a okay. coffee section with like an espresso machine and um, a section where we put all of our cinnamon rolls, a rack with all of our bread. And so all of our cooking and our selling happens in okay, that Okay, gotcha, gotcha. Yes. But I do think the more typical idea of a micro bakery yeah. is selling in your home, which both of us did do before right, opening before this, this um, more like, more like yes. small. I mean, it is a micro bakery, but yes. definitely it was, I think, a... Uh, we grew to that. Yes. Now, what was the process like for getting licenses? And then if you don't have a commercial kitchen, what are the licenses that you need to just do this in your, just right in your own kitchen to start? So every state is different. And I think Ohio might be on the lenient side. We're in Ohio. Um, But most of the time you can 
you can function with cottage food laws. Definitely if you're making sourdough bread, um, you can f- really, as long as you package things correctly, which is putting your address, your phone number, and the name of your business, and the ingredients. You have to list your ingredients. Okay. Packaging is really the main requirement. Um, I don't think you need to be inspected. Is that right? Yeah. No. So. There's no inspection process. Um, And if you're curious, I think I would definitely advise people. I feel like when we started communicating with the health department, we were so scared. Mm -hmm. It was like this terrifying experience to have to deal with the health department. They are a really good resource. So if you are someone that is wanting to start any kind of food venture, I think the first thing to do is to call your local health department and they will tell you exactly what your next step is. And usually... With cottage food laws, it's pretty reasonable. When you we were talking about, the main thing is you just want to be really conscious about practicing cleanliness and working in a clean kitchen and mm-hmm. all that sort of thing. Yeah. We took, I so we went and visited, there was a woman that was catering out of her home and we went and looked at her setup before we got started. And what she had done was taken her mudroom. And so this is an idea if you want to stay in your home, but you want to kind of take that next step to the commercial kitchen. She had her kitchen had remained her home kitchen and she had taken a mudroom and transferred it, transformed it into a commercial kitchen. Um, And that worked really nicely for her. And I think that's what I've seen a lot of people online do, um, because that way it's not interrupting. Yeah, it's not interrupting the daily function of your kitchen. It's just a separate area that you can keep really clean and up to standards more easily. Yeah. So what's the what makes you go from wanting to just do it in your kitchen and have like the cottage laws to doing the commercial kitchen with the health department? What uh, what advantage you already mentioned keeping it all separate, clean? What other what's the reason that you move to that next step? Because you are only allowed to have a residential oven in order to bake by cottage food law. Oh, that is, I think, the okay. reason that people switch to commercial because they want a big bread oven in order to have the quantity that they're like, maybe they're needing. Oh, you're and you're not allowed to use that oven until you're not allowed to have a secondary oven in your residential com- cottage food kitchen. If you want to sell. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I did not know that. Yeah. That's, okay. I, I so you can't just go pop one thing. of those ovens down in your basement and I totally thought you could have done that. Yeah. Um, interesting. So I think when okay. you start pulling commercial equipment in, you you need a commercial kitchen. Okay. And that process isn't as intimidating as I'm thinking. Like starting starting the commercial kitchen, like it. I think people think that that's not something just a regular person can do. But then hearing you say that, it's like yeah, that sort of opens up your mind a little bit. Like wait, that's such something somebody can do. Yes. Yeah. I, you just have to figure out the steps, and it can be a little expensive. I mean. You do, that's when you start buying the commercial equipment, right? I mean, that's Mm -hmm. probably the biggest expense. And I think the nice thing about, you know, waiting a little bit and being able to afford that equipment is you get to learn your market a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. So when you're just starting out in your home, Mm -hmm. you kind of, you know, test the water, see what people are wanting. And then once you know what people want, you can base your equipment on that. Yeah. So if you find out, people don't really care that much about sourdough bread in your area, then you don't want to go and buy a bread Mm -hmm, oven. You instead maybe want to buy a commercial mixer or something like that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. What's your process for making the bowls? Like, are you stretching and folding all of them? Are you doing like 10 X? What does that look like for like, do you have a massive bowl? So we mix (laughs) our, we mix the dough in a, in our big mixer. A commercial mixer. And then we do, we transfer it to um, like plastic, like the big plastic cameras. Okay. Mm-hmm. And we do stretch and folds all at one time. Okay. And then we do, we have to hand. So it, after the stretch and fold, it does the first proof. We dump it all out on this huge island and um, to, we divide the bowls by weight. And then we, ha- we hand shape them. Okay. So that is probably the longest step. Okay in the sourdough process. So after they're shaped, we go in the banditons and then we have to put them all in the refrigerator so that they stay in the, they stay in the fridge for two nights. So we shape them on Thursday. Okay. We shape all the sourdough on Thursday. It stays in the fridge till Saturday morning and then it's baked on Saturday morning. 
So what time were you getting up on Saturday morning? I'm curious. <laughs> so our dad, I don't know if we mentioned this. So it's me, Ellen, and then our dad is actually our third partner mm-hmm. who does baking with us, which okay. most people think it's our mom. I think they think it's kind of funny that our dad is. He sees an opportunity. Too. Dad will jump in, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, so he gets up first. He starts the baking at three in the okay. morning. Yeah. And then we roll out of bed at 4.30. Roll out. <laughs> mosey on in. <laughs> Casually. <laughs> and then um, at 4.30, that's when uh, our other full-time employee comes and we come. And that's when it all starts to kind of okay. move quickly. Yeah. 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 So we're baking, we're icing things and um, getting everything ready to go. Okay. So the two of you, do you meet down at the barn? I don't know how far it is from your house with all of your kids what time of day is that happening? Are you like, I think the moms are wondering yeah. how you do that. Even though you do it throughout the week, I'm sure there's still, you know, some difficult aspects of that. How is that working? Well, I think we have to kind of go back. So we've grown a lot in the last two years, probably we've, we've really started growing. So two years ago, we had everything planned out. We've got the five to 7 a.m. like block of time, you know, where before everybody starts waking up. And then you have the yeah, night, nap, the nap time block yeah. of time. And then you have the right. after bed block of time. And so we were trying to schedule everything kind of in those three shifts. Um, I So I live on the property. So it's like just I can put everybody to bed, have the monitor on, go out to the bakery, um, get things okay. done. And yeah. it definitely got to the That's point nice. where, I mean, that is, that is certainly doable. And we were definitely doing that for a long time. I, like, I remember the time when I told a friend of mine, I feel like I'm a full-time working mom, which for me was not my goal. Uh-huh. That was not my objective. And she said, well, you're having growing pains. And I, that was so true. I think you get to a point where you need to either decide, this is getting to be too much of a time commitment. Do I want to either invest in new equipment, invest in help? Or scale back and just be content with um, where where we were. Right. Yep. And, Those are the options yes, with every business. And, yes. Mm-hmm. And for us, it kind of worked out perfectly. It just it just worked out nicely. Our sister was really she came to us and was like, "I'm really looking for a change," um, and she wanted to come work at, in the bakery, and we're so excited to have oh, her. Okay. Cool. And that really changed everything. Yeah. It made things so much easier. Yeah. So our sister or we have three sisters, but our sister is our full-time employee. Yeah. Okay. We um, never said that. So I just thought we'd clarify. Yeah. 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 But so as it grew, you're able to do that. Yes. Okay. It, it really changed everything and made it much more possible for us to meet our family goals and yeah. balance those with the business. So I think, yeah, I think there are ways when you're even, when you're in a small working from your home business, I think there are ways that you can hire people to do delivery. If that's what you're doing, hire people to work on your social media, um, things like that. There are ways that you can delegate, I guess, yes. to make it more doable. You just have to kind of figure that out. Yeah. And you know, I think sometimes people hear that and think, okay, we'll see, they have help. But you did not start with help. So what did this process look like over time? I mean, at first, like you said, yeah. you were pulling, doing everything. You were pulling the early morning shift, the late night shift. But then after yeah. you had a certain amount of customer base and you'd figured out your processes, you'd invested in your equipment, you're ready to scale it in a sense yeah. and go to that next level where you're not the only one involved. And that's just by being smart with your money and your time and your delegation skills. So I think that's encouraging really that anybody can do it. Yeah, you can. There's thing, changes you can make for sure. And it could have, what could have happened is that we could have not expanded. Yeah. What we could have done. Is yes. That's an option as well. That, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. We could have made a bulk amount of dough on Wednesday just for cinnamon rolls and then roll it all out on Friday during those times that we have. And we could have just sold cinnamon rolls to Mm -hmm. 30 people, you know, and that would have made us Uh a nice little chunk of change extra. Yeah. Yeah. And that falls under cottage food laws. You can eat, you can pretty easily do that in your kitchen. kitchen. So I think you just have to figure out what your goal is. Yeah. You can do this at all different levels. Definitely. And find out what works for your particular situation. So what was your goal? What what goal did you yeah. set out? I'm sure you both like sat down with your husbands. Maybe you sat down together. What did you decide was the goal for your, both of your families? 
So when we started out uh, initially, I was, I had worked as a NICU nurse full time and I just had my first baby and I decided um, to stay home. So I remember my first goal, I had been, I had just started this retirement account, like when I first started my job and I'd been putting into that and I thought if I could just make enough money to like keep that retirement account going, that would be so helpful um, to our family. I mean, that was just kind of a way to conceptualize yeah. what you wanted to sell. Right. So that was like my first goal. And it was, I mean, you need something like that to real, to kind of figure out what quantity you want to be selling, what is realistic as far as how many loaves of bread are you going to have to sell to make that amount of money? Can I make that many loaves of bread in my home? Mm-hmm. Um, and that sort of thing. Yeah. Like we had a notebook and I remember we wrote out everything we yeah. wanted to have that weekend just to see if like, is this actually going to make us yes. what in our heads we, we think we can make? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So like we definitely needed that to figure out, is this worth it? Because our time is really precious right now. Yeah. Like every moment seems very precious. Yes. So. And then when you reach those goals, it's so exciting and encouraging and makes you feel like you're doing the right thing. Yeah. I want to tell you about something that we love in our home and have been using for so many years, long before I had a podcast and was partnering with them, and that is Azure Standard. Azure Standard is a co-op, so you get together with like-minded individuals in your community to pool a huge order of organic and natural foods that you can get in bulk and high quality ingredients that you might not be able to find locally and get them for a cheaper price. So the way it works, you get on the Azure Standard website. So Azure, A-Z-U-R, standard.com and find a local drop location for you. Where I live, I have two different Azure Standard drop locations already established within a 30 minute radius from me. So it makes it really easy to place a large monthly order. It doesn't have to be large necessarily, but for our family, that's definitely what it ends up being. And go pick it up once a month to stock up on all kinds of things that I cannot find at my local grocery store. Things like a 50 pound bag of organic wheat berries or a 25 pound bag of einkorn flour, organic produce, even seasonal deals. So if something is in season, you can get it for an even better price. Right when you get on the Azure Standard website, you will see the current seasonal deals. Definitely recommend checking those out, especially this time of year. We get our animal feed. We get so many things, butter, cheese, sour cream, raw cheddar. There is certainly something that you are currently stocking that you could get for a much better price on Azure Standard or better quality or both. Azure Standard is offering Simple Farmhouse Life listeners a discount on your first order by using the code SIMPLE15. Code applies to first-time Azure customers. It's 15% off a minimum order of $100 or more delivered to a drop location in your area. This is a one-time use code, so make sure to head over to azurestandard.com, A-Z-U-R-E standard. Dot com. Use the code SIMPLE15. Find some things that you are maybe already using or things that you want to try or that are a better price or better quality. Stock up and find your local drop. Again, thank you so much to Azure Standard for sponsoring this episode. Yeah, I think a lot of people when they start a business in their home, they get really excited to make sales and they tend to forget about all the money that went into it, the time that went into it. A lot of times people don't want to mm-hmm. bill for their time. And it's really smart yes. to upfront lay out goals, lay out how many loaves of bread you need to sell, how many cinnamon rolls you need to sell, how many clients you need to get in order to reach that goal. And then work it back and think, is this possible with what I currently have? Should I pursue this? Mm-hmm. I think a lot of entrepreneurs forget to even do that math. Yeah. Or even like schedule out your, like, what does your whole week look like? If you're scheduling out your time, is that what you want your week to look like? Um, I think that's a big thing. Is that something that I'm going to be content doing week after week for years and years? Yeah. And if it's not, then that's not a good plan. And sometimes though, like you guys did, you probably looked at it, thought, Ooh, that's a lot. But then maybe after six months, we could get a roller thing. Sorry, I forget what that's called. <laughs> the thing that, the <laughs> sheeter. And then maybe after six more months, we can get an employee and, and looking at it long-term knowing this isn't forever because you know a lot of times there is going to be that upfront time where life mm-hmm. feels a little bit crazy with almost any business. But then as long as you can look ahead and see that that's not how it's always going to be, if I take these steps, 
that I think it makes it yeah. still very doable. Like how do you get out of survival mode? I feel like we were in survival yeah. mode. For yeah. You don't want to stay there. Years. Yeah. No, <laughs> <laughs> definitely not. It's really amazing. Like when you talk about blogging and your blogging business, I feel like there are so many parallels. Oh yeah. And maybe it's just all small businesses mm-hmm. are like this, yeah. but like when you talk about it, I'm like, yes, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Like every, almost every aspect has a parallel to it. Yeah. I was actually, I love like entrepreneur stuff. So I was listening to an interview, but that was like somebody whose business is way, 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 way further than mine. And essentially they were saying they started hiring people to be more strategic in their business because all businesses are the same. And I'm like, you know what? I really thought about that. I guess in a way, all businesses are the same, just different products, but then you have marketing. So that's the same. It's just different tweaks depending on what industry you're in. But that was a question we got a lot about was how do you market this? How are you getting all of these customers? And you're small little, I'm assuming you're in a small town. Maybe you're not. Yeah. We We, we're in a pretty small town. We're lucky to be close to other areas that have, you know, lots of people, but the biggest thing was Facebook. Okay. And yeah, that's what I assumed. It Facebook. really has. Yeah. 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 We don't really spend that much money on marketing, which because of social media. Yeah. I actually yeah. recently, because I knew we were doing this topic, I joined a Facebook group on um, micro bakeries just yeah. to see what everyone was saying on there. And um, one woman was saying she spent like $10 on a Facebook ad and that got her 30 customers and those 30 customers are the only people she really caters to. Needed. And that's her whole business yeah, yeah. is just yeah. returning customers, providing them their weekly bread. I just, I think that's genius. Yeah. Word of mouth is definitely huge. Yeah. That all goes back to customer service and providing an experience for your customers. Like they are driving outside of town to kind of go out in the middle of nowhere to this bakery and, I feel like that's, I mean, that's so, we think that we're so thankful that they're willing to do that. But as a result, we have to provide an experience. You have to provide that experience for your customers. Yeah. Well, especially with the Facebook, with being able to target everybody locally, I can see how that would be so beneficial. Whereas something like blogging and YouTube, it's such like more of a mass scale. Like if you get Mm -hmm. a million visitors, you get X amount of dollars. Well, with this micro bakery, if you have 30 repeat customers, Mm -hmm. that's pretty Mm -hmm. much it. That's all you need. If they're buying all of their baked goods with you, you don't really need to reach the masses. You just need people who want to buy from you every single week. And that's such a fun experience to like have these customers that are coming back week after week and that you have a real relationship with and you're providing them with their bread for the week. Like Mm -hmm. that just, we were talking about just the romantic idea of like a Paris bakery where you're going down to get your baguette for the day. I think people get really excited yes. about that, you know, yes. and it's a lot of fun. So I feel like that's such a, a unique connection, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I think it's probably the reason there's kind of this rise yeah. in micro bakeries. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think people are kind of hungry for that. Yeah. And people are hungry. Women are hungry. A lot of women to earn a little bit of income from home. And that's a real tangible way to do it, to serve people with something that you've learned in your own kitchen. And so I I agree. Now you also mentioned that you do some espresso. So did you bring in another person who acts as a barista on Saturday mornings (laughs) or how does that work? (laughs) We, we, uh, (laughs) We, you just we do can it. Do whatever we <laughs> yes set our yes. minds. <laughs> Delusion. Delusion. <laughs> uh, we actually have a, a coffee trailer. I don't know if uh, that's another part of our business. Okay, we, yeah. Tell us about been that. A dream. For a been a dream. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so we we have this coffee trailer, and we wanted um, to make sure we had a good roaster. We wanted to find a good roaster to make our coffee better. So we met with a roaster and he then was an espresso wholesaler. So he actually trained us in to be baristas. Oh, wow. And so (laughs) to be a barista, which, yeah, that was just a really great connection to make. Yeah. I guess I was just, um, I mentioned all that because if you ever were thinking about starting a coffee trailer or any type of coffee business, I think a great piece of advice is to find a roaster that does deal with espresso espresso machines and is able to show you the ropes and everything. That was mm-hmm. just so helpful for us. 
And fun. But, we we and are so drinking fun. all of our profits. <laughs> oh, I bet. <laughs> we drink so much espresso. It's it's bad, but <laughs> Oh man, that would be you dangerous have an espresso for me. Machine too, don't you? I do. I it's I dangerous. love yeah. espresso. Actually, we just had a, a maker's market this last weekend, and my daughter this time did espresso. So she just instead of bringing the machine, just the day before she made fifty That's shots of espresso and then just measured it out and mixed it with like the syrups and the milk and the ice. But that leads me to ask you the question: Which thing is more profitable, the coffee truck or trailer? Or the bakery, What? which one would you recommend starting if somebody wants to start one? The bakery is much more profitable for us. That's just our, that's our experience. Okay. Um, you it's have to sell early, yeah. quite yeah. a bit of coffee, wouldn't you say? Yeah. Like per item, the baked items are just much more profitable. Yeah. Our business plan is kind of unique too. It is. yeah. Like we okay. sell cinnamon rolls in four and six, in four packs. And six packs. So like... Each customer, like our average sale per customer is pretty high. Yeah. So I think that's why our bakery has been more profitable than coffee because the coffee per customer is just is just lower. You just have to sell more. Well, yeah. I mean, that's always going to be the case, right? Like they're just going to drink one cup. It's not like they're going to buy their weekly coffee from you at that moment. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But it's definitely been really fun. Like I, it, a dream it's come a fun, true. It's, it's <laughs> yeah, part of the experience piece for for customers, I think everyone gets yeah. to okay. get their drink when they're when they come. So that's yeah. true. Yeah. So it kind of helps your bakery business and to offer the coffee. Yeah. yeah. Cause we're trying to be like the Saturday morning destination, you know, a little bit. So it helps with that. Uh-huh. Man, we I would so come because my daughter, like we we go into town to go to the farmer's market and to go get a cup of coffee just because it is that experience. So it, yeah, yeah, like that seems like every town would love something like that, and the ladies would come because they just, <laughs> we're looking for something cute like that to do on a Saturday morning. Yeah, well, we yeah, would well, love for you to come. We have <laughs> talked about it many times. Yeah, that'd be so uh, fun. <laughs> we're yeah, our whole family. Like when we said we were coming on this podcast, they were like, "You guys are cool now." <laughs> Before. You were not that cool now. <laughs> you are awesome. Oh my word. That is so, so you've given us so a lot of clout. Funny. <laughs> oh wow. No, but well, great. <laughs> Our mom watches you too and she's like, You have to invite her. I will keep all of her family. I will keep her children. We have plenty of room. No. <laughs> that sounds fun. I don't no. think you guys are that far from me. If you're, are you in Iowa or Ohio? Or I thought I saw Iowa on something, but where are you? We're in Ohio. Okay. Okay. Ohio. Um, Columbus Central area. Ohio area. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. You mentioned mm-hmm. farmers markets though. And yeah. I, I think something that's interesting, we were just talking about this is that most small towns can't sustain a bakery Mm -hmm. and that's why you find them in big cities like Chicago and um, New York. That's where you really find a lot of bakeries, but these small towns, they just don't have enough people to Mm -hmm. sustain a bakery to be open every single day. Like a classic brick and mortar. Right. Right. Yeah. Because they have to pay rent. They have to pay employees. So all of that being open every day just costs a lot of money. That's why our situation has been so doable for us because mm-hmm. we're making, we're open the most popular times right. and we don't have to pay rent. And I think that's why micro bakeries yeah. are kind of thriving uh-huh. right now. It's yeah. They have a lot of flexibility to say, this is when I can get my bread out and ready to sell. And you can kind of do what works best for you. Yeah. Which is very nice. It's exciting. It's an exciting movement because I want there to be those Mm -hmm. in everywhere I go. I want to be able to go get sourdough bread if I'm in another Mm -hmm. town on vacation or Mm -hmm. traveling or just somewhere to go. Even if I just want to go on a Saturday and just pick some stuff up that I don't have to bake. I think that is such a a neat idea. And I I do hope it sweeps the nation. So are are you open even through the winter, just year round on Saturday? We are. Yes. Except January. We're off. That's so cool. So even, yeah. 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 That gives somebody to do even when the farmer's markets are closed. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's just really neat how people have really been, I mean, we kind of are like, okay, you have to be here on Saturday from eight to 11, be there or be square. And people have been so generous about it, which is just amazing to me. Like, I think people really are looking for some fun, different things. And it's just like this time when you can do some creative things 
with business. And uh-huh. yeah, and you talked about moms. You's like the ladies yeah. would come out like we're so hungry for like that connection to yes. like, get out and to go get fresh bread. And yes. we also offer those classes. And oh yeah, I've that, to ask I think you about is that. also that's yeah, a, that's a, been a big part of our business and a lot of fun. That is so yeah. that when do you host those other than Saturday? Every Tuesday we have, um, most Tuesdays we have. a class. Okay. So what kind of classes are you offering? So we have sourdough classes. That's our most popular. Um, and then we also like this summer we're doing a harvest series. So a lot of that is going to be helping to people to learn how to utilize things from their garden. Um, we're doing like a fresh sweet corn class and how to preserve it and different recipes and things like that. And then we also do some just like really fun girls night out type classes, like charcuterie, oh, um, yeah. how to put charcuterie boards together, things like that. We have a definitely a range of different things. Okay. So anybody, if you're listening and you live near me and if you know where I live and you live near me, I need you to open this exact business in your <laughs> barn because this sounds so fun. And I love the idea that we're as customers, as moms, consumers, we are learning to go out of our way to get food. Like we're learning to go to the farmer and get the milk, go to the farmer's market yeah. and, you know, get some vegetables, go to the farmer to get meat. And I, I do a, a pickup where I pick up from, for meat and then for Azure standard, and then go to your micro bakery and get your coffee and your bread and your cinnamon rolls. I think that entire movement is such a shift in the way we've done things mm-hmm. for so long. And I think it's really cool. Yeah, I do too. And I feel like most people maybe don't even know about it. So they don't have the confidence to yeah. just realize that people are hungry for that. Like, yeah, there you cannot go to your grocery store and get freshly baked bread. No. And most likely you don't have a bakery in your town. So no, you got to realize that there's this opening for yeah. these kinds of businesses mm-hmm. and you got to take the opportunity and find your customers, find your people and you can actually make it work for your community. Now, what has it been like financially? You've been able to reach the goals that you have. This has helped your family. I mean, that's all been a success for you, correct? Yes. So she, she was very much the driving force because she was a baker from the start, but I was in college when she kind of started the bakery. And so when she needed help, I started to help her. I thought, oh, this will be a fun part-time thing for me to do after I graduate because I was in school for nursing. And then right at the time that I was graduating, we were making enough where I felt like it could be my full-time income. Mm -hmm. So it was comparable to my, I mean, it's not, it's not a nurse's salary, but (laughs) it was enough where I thought. But just the very fact that you get to live your life as a mom. I mean, you know, we all have to have money. That's not, not, that's not a thing that, you know, you just can go without. So you were able to take what career probably would have been very demanding, wouldn't have given you much flexibility and then open something like this. I think a lot of people can be persuaded to look into this. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's a great option. Yeah. So I was able to not, not ever work as a nurse. I immediately went full-time into the bakery and it's really, it's done much better than we ever had anticipated. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, that is so cool. So what's next for you? What do you, are you just going to continue? Do you have any big goals? Anything you're trying to add on to the business? Um, <laughs> well, I, I mean, I feel like right now we're kind of like, maybe we can just keep things yeah. going until we get out of baby land. <laughs> right. Yes. I feel like that's kind of where we are right now, but we have so many ideas all the time Yeah, and it's just always looking at an idea, getting really excited about it and then saying, okay, maybe that doesn't fit in with my family goals right now. <laughs> yeah. So we've done a little bit of that <laughs> recently, but yeah. Yep. That's... But, I mean, being satisfied. With you. <laughs> hey, that's a good, honestly, maintaining what you're doing yeah. is a good goal. I've for the last, I would say four New Year's mornings. <laughs> that's exactly what I say whenever somebody's like, "So, what's your yeah. goal this year?" I'm like, yeah. "It's just to keep doing what I'm doing." I, I, I get the big yes. eyes, like, "Oh, I want to do this and this," and yeah. then I'm like, "I can't do that. Like, I cannot do that without yeah. sacrificing a lot." Yes, I know that I could make so much more money. I could do all, you know, but ultimately for what, no. right? So, I think that that's a real smart yeah. goal. Must be happy. 
Yes. My, oh, my husband, he wants to, he's like, we could open a brick and mortar and we could just really blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, I, that is so overwhelming. Yeah. Me. Yeah. I, and it just doesn't fit in with what we want. So I don't know. Yeah. Well, that's maybe someday we'll get there. I mean, I think it's important just to consider your goals and just keep those at the forefront of your mind. It's not always to be the biggest bakery. I mean, this, the micro bakery concept, the simplicity of it, the being open once a week, I think that's the yeah. beauty of it. And so you don't really necessarily need to move anywhere beyond no. that. And getting to stay at home. I mean, we, that's just really been a blessing. Yeah. Yeah. But also we saw that someone sent you pajamas the other day. And now I would like to be an influencer just so that someone would <laughs> yes, send me pajamas. Um, <laughs> I was never really tempted by that. And now I'm like... <laughs> She's just getting pajamas in the mail. That's the most amazing thing. That's yeah. The, <laughs> yeah. So yeah, the influencer life does have its perks. It definitely does. That's for sure. I, I hesitate to say the influencer, but it is, you know, what it is what it is. <laughs> but you can definitely live your life without cute pajamas. <laughs> oh, yeah. You can. You can, but is it as enjoyable? I don't know. <laughs> Well, thank you so much. Tell everybody again where to find you, where to find your bread. I mean, you know, if they're local, I don't know if it's ever like a thing. Have you ever considered shipping your bread? That's a whole other question. But like where they can find you if they're local and where they can find you online if you have a blog and all that stuff. Um, so our website is flowerbarn.com. Um, and that's the website for the bakery. And then we also have the Flower Barn Homestead. And that's our blog. Um, both of those are great places find us and then we're located in marysville ohio yeah so on our cute. family farm if you go to the website you're able to find the address we're on google maps and yeah. apple maps and um, we're open every saturday to 11 and like we said we offer classes every tuesday um usually it's at night in the evenings so yeah yeah and our blog is growing so <laughs> oh it's so cute too if you go see their little like the website you can see the barn and all the stuff that's that's yeah. adorable you have to stop by if you're anywhere anywhere near <laughs> where you are yeah looks like something yeah. to see Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining me. Well, thank you. All right. Well, I hope that you enjoyed this episode. Make sure to go check out the Flower Barn Bakery and consider starting one in your own town. I think this is such a neat movement. Also go check out their blog as well. They're sharing recipes and their experience with all of this. Again, that's over at flowerbarn.com. Again, thank you so much for listening and I will see you in the next episode of the Simple Farmhouse Life Podcast.